In the annals of history, some ships get, fairly or unfairly, labeled as unlucky. An argument can be made that no ship in the modern day gets hit harder with that than USS William D. Porter. Good ol' Willie D. This ship is where unfairly labeled comes into the equation. As the title says, her most infamous moment did actually happen. The ship did accidentally fire a torpedo at USS Iowa while the president was aboard. Although, even this story is embellished. Pretty much every other instance of bad luck is either greatly exaggerated, or there's no evidence of it in contemporary records. With one notable exception, other than the torpedo. Me, personally, I think the ship should really be remembered for keeping her entire crew alive. In any event, let's begin the story of USS William D. Porter. Laid down on May 7th, 1942, and launched on September 27th of the same year, Porter's career began quietly enough. The ship was launched in Orange, Texas, and began fitting out like any other destroyer. This process lasted until July 6th, 1943, at which point the ship was commissioned into the United States Navy. As a Fletcher-class destroyer, Porter was one of many ships of this type, armed with five 5-inch five guns in single mounts, and 10 21-inch torpedoes in two quintuple mounts amidships, along with a smattering of various anti-aircraft guns and depth charges. With all of that equipment fitted, Porter began her shakedown cruise. This lasted through the end of August 1943 with the result that Porter only formally entered service in late September after a post-shakedown refit, following which she spent her initial career on battle practice with the Atlantic Fleet, about as quiet of duty as you can get, in the middle of a global war. The first real excitement for the destroyer and her largely green crew came in November 1943. Specifically, on November 12, 1943, the destroyer left Norfolk to join up with USS Iowa. The battleship was carrying President Franklin Roosevelt to the Cairo and Tehran conferences. This should have been prestigious duty for William D. Porter and her crew. Of course, that wasn't how it turned out. Although this is also where the internet legends begin to creep in. Now, I've looked high and low to try and identify where these stories started. There's probably a good dozen articles, ranging from something as silly as Cracked, to various historical websites. All of these articles repeat basically the same story, often linking back to each other in a circle of references. The earliest reference I've found is an archived link to the old version of the Iowa Veterans Association website, itself a reprinting of an article from 1994 in the Retired Officer magazine. This article, by one Kit Bonner, gives no citations. I'm not going to claim the author was lying. That said, it does seem this article was the source for all of the repeating stories that have cropped up over the last two decades. And the lack of citations makes this feel like old sea stories that have been repeated over and over in circular fashion. A classic issue with pop history. Regardless, let's look at these as I continue through Porter's story. The first of the unconfirmed stories of this article comes from before Porter even left Doc, or while she was leaving Doc, as this story is often changed in the retelling. As the story goes, Porter managed to snag her anchor on one of her sister ships resting alongside her. This resulted in the other destroyer being torn up, with the railing and lifeboats and other equipment ripped off the deck. That's the kind of thing that really would be formally reported, and definitely would be in the logbooks. However, it's notably absent in the logs of any of the ships involved. Porter's makes no mention of it, and the ships she was moored with, Cogswell and Young, also do not bring this up. You would think another destroyer tore up my deck would be in there, but apparently it isn't. The same holds true for the next story about Porter. After this supposed mishap with her sister ship, 
the destroyer sets sail to join up with Iowa. After doing so, there's a story that Porter accidentally dropped a depth charge on November 13th. The resultant explosion immediately set the entire formation on alert as the escorts jumped into anti-submarine maneuvers. Again, this is really the kind of thing that would be mentioned in the ship's logbooks. Not a single log from Iowa to Porter mentions either a depth charge or a hunt for a false submarine sighting. All that is mentioned is the destroyer having a boiler tube failure. That forced her to fall out of formation temporarily, which would be embarrassing enough on its own without embellishing the story. After this, though, we leave internet legend and return to confirmed events. On November 14th, 1943, the Iowa engaged in anti-aircraft target drills. While this was happening, her escorting destroyers performed their own torpedo drills. They practiced simulated launches using Iowa, a big and convenient object, as the target. This should have passed without issue. However, aboard Porter, one of the torpedoes in Mount 2 was accidentally launched because a primer had not been removed properly. This fish swam directly at the battleship, carrying the President of the United States. With the formation operating on radio silence, Porter's captain frantically tried signaling Iowa by signal lamp. The crew, inexperienced and understandably panicking, botched this. The first signal said the torpedo was coming from port instead of starboard. The second one said the destroyer was in full reverse. Eventually, realizing this wasn't working, Porter broke radio silence. They signaled to Iowa, come hard right, to warn them to turn away from the torpedo. The battleship did make the turn, as the torpedo harmlessly detonated in Iowa's wake. Roosevelt supposedly treated this as a big game by having his Secret Service agents wheel him over to the side of the ship to watch the torpedo. Another of the stories about this incident even says those agents drew their pistols to aim and presumably shoot at the torpedo. All of this is pretty well confirmed. The logs on both Iowa and Porter make mention of the torpedo. So this part is definitely true. Where things go back to internet myth is in the follow-up. The story says that Iowa turned all her guns on Porter, as clearly the destroyer's crew had just tried to assassinate the president. The destroyer was ordered to sail to Bermuda, where her crew would be placed under arrest upon arrival. Marines surrounded the ship as the entire crew was arrested. The first time this had ever happened on an American ship. And the captain's career was over at this point. Except, from all indications, none of that actually happened. Iowa's log makes no mention of aiming her weapons on Porter. While some of the anti-aircraft guns could theoretically have done so on their own authority, the big guns wanted act without formal orders, which there is no evidence of that I've seen. As for the crew being arrested, or the captain's career coming to an end, Porter did sail to Bermuda after the incident with Iowa. However, this was not because the crew was going to be arrested. It was to meet up with relief destroyers while an investigation took place to figure out what happened. This seems to have resulted in Chief Torpedoman's mate, Lawton C. Dawson, being court-martialed. He was reduced in rank by one grade. Various stories, again tying back to that one article, will say Dawson was sentenced to 14 years of hard labor until President Roosevelt intervened, asking he not be punished because it was an honest accident. While I'd like to believe FDR would be kind enough to do that, there's no real evidence of either the hard labor or the president intervening. Another internet myth, near as I can tell. As for the captain, Lieutenant Commander Wilfred Walter would remain in command until May 30th, 1944. The U.S. Naval Institute has an article that cites him as retiring as a rear admiral. With this entire mess behind her, though, Porter shifted oceans from the Atlantic to the Pacific. The destroyer had been reassigned, some will say banished, to the Aleutian Islands. This was a cold backwater theater of the war, 
after the Japanese had abandoned Kiska Island in July of 1943. It's easy to see why this could be written off as banishing the destroyer. More realistically, it was just the luck of the draw because someone still had to patrol the cold Alaskan waters. Porter would arrive in Dutch Harbor on December 29th, and the destroyer would spend January through September of 1944 in the frozen north. Porter spent most of her time in the Aleutians on anti-submarine patrol duty. An exception to this rule came in three bombardments of the Kurile Islands, or two bombardments and one attempted action. The first of these was on June 13th, 1944, the second on June 26th, and the third attempt, while called off by bad weather, was on August 1st. Other than this, her service was pretty uneventful, fitting, really, for a backwater theater. This duty came to an end in September of 1944, when Porter sailed to San Francisco for a short refit, and then on to join the Pacific War properly. Before I cover that, however, there was another myth about her time in Alaska. Specifically, that a sailor got drunk enough to think firing one of the 5-inch guns was a brilliant idea, and somehow... No one managed to stop him from loading and firing one of the main battery weapons. With the result, a shell landed in the front yard, or backyard depending on the telling, of the base commander. Again, as far as I'm aware, there's no actual written evidence. Regardless, all of these mishaps, real or imagined, had prompted other ships to greet Porter with, Don't shoot, we're Republicans a play on FDR being a Democrat, and the ship's mishap with the torpedo. It didn't do much to endear new crewmen to their ship, unfortunately. With this reputation hanging over her head, Porter reached the front line in November of 1944. By that point, the liberation of the Philippines was well underway, and the Japanese, while they had shot their bolt at Leyte, were still very much a going concern. Porter was subjected to air attack almost immediately after she arrived. Two aircraft were shot down during that attack, one before it reached Porter's gun range. The other one, however, was shot down by Porter and the other ships in the anchorage. Not the most exciting thing, but the crew was probably quite happy to redeem themselves, if only a little bit. After that incident, the rest of 1944 was mostly without excitement. Porter escorted convoys between the various islands and the Philippines, with only one more air attack to note. On December 21st, 1944, Porter was escorting a convoy from Leyte to Mindoro. This convoy was attacked by six aircraft in two waves. The first two missed with their bombs, but made their escape despite Porter's best efforts. A second wave came around soon after that, this time consisting of four aircraft. Once more, they failed to land any hits. This time, though, Porter downed one of the planes and helped down a second one with the other escorting destroyers. No more attacks came at that point, although Porter sank an abandoned Japanese landing barge the next morning. As for 1945, it would follow much the same pattern. Porter supported the landings on Luzon from January 2nd through February 15th. This would see the destroyer defend against air attack, kamikazes included, and provide shore bombardment and anti-submarine work. Her own role was fairly average during this, and on the 15th, the destroyer set off for Guam, before returning to Luzon until March 21st, 1945. This time was spent preparing for the invasion of Okinawa. When that came on April 1st, Porter returned to shore bombardments and anti-aircraft sentry duty. Between April 1st and May 5th, the destroyer fired something like 8,500 rounds of 5-inch ammunition and added five more aircraft to her kill tally. Not spectacular by any means, but also not a bad showing either. During this duty, though, Another myth cropped up, that Porter accidentally riddled USS Looch with friendly fire. This is another thing that doesn't seem to be mentioned 
in contemporary records. However, it wouldn't be long until Porter's second confirmed bad luck incident struck. Porter switched to picket duty from May 5th through June 10th. This was the same duty in the same general area that saw USS Laffey savaged by kamikaze attack. Porter would ultimately fall victim to the same kind of attack. Well, to kamikaze attack. She wasn't hit by wave after wave of aircraft, however. On June 10th, 1945, Porter was minding her own business, performing her valuable duty, until at 8.15 in the morning, a single Japanese aircraft descended from the clouds. This was a D-3A Val, which was entirely obsolete by that point in the war. Even an obsolete dive bomber could still be deadly in the right hands. Porter began evasive maneuvers to try and avoid the attacker. The story differs a bit depending on the retelling in this regard. Either Porter avoided the bomber and it crashed on its own, or she shot the Val down and it crashed alongside. Regardless of which chain of events you look at, the result is the same. That obsolete dive bomber, the only kamikaze to attack Porter, crashed alongside and continued on before its deadly payload exploded right underneath poor Willie D. Porter. This explosion lifted Porter out of the water before dropping her right back down. This caused damage that was ultimately fatal. Porter's power died and her steam lines broke. Fires raged aboard the ship as well. Porter remained afloat for three hours as her crew fought to save their ship. In the end, the damage was just too severe. Her captain was forced to order abandoned ship, and 12 minutes after that order went out, Porter sank by the stern. For as embarrassing as this is, it's also a proud moment. The supposedly cursed bad luck destroyer kept her crew alive. Not one man died in the effort to save the ship, or while abandoning her. Hopefully, after listening to this, you can see why I prefer this to be USS William D. Porter's legacy. Keeping her crew alive until the very end. Not a bunch of unconfirmed internet legends. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content. And I'll see you in the next one.